Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for your steadfastness. Thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, I don't know the trials that we may be going through individually. Some are facing health issues. Some are facing relational marital issues. Some here this morning may be facing some financial needs. Lord, you know everything about us uniquely. And we're just thankful that you're a God who sees all and knows all. And help us today as we worship you and as we give you praise to be reminded in our hearts that your hand is always there guiding us and leading us and helping us. So I pray that our hearts can be renewed and that we can find hope and we can find strength in you. That we can leave here today being able to face another week because we know there's a God who's going to be with us and a God who will provide. And as we open your word now, we ask that you will send your Holy Spirit to be in our midst. As we open your word, help us to understand the, the importance of your word and how you're speaking to our hearts today. So thank you. Open our minds, open our hearts, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you've been with us over the summer months, you know that we have been looking at the two letters that Paul wrote to the believers in Thessalonica. And both of Paul's letters deal with issues surrounding the second coming of Jesus. If you ever have read these two letters, you know in the first letter he's addressing the reality of the second coming and how important it is to be ready for Christ's return. And what he wrote in those chapters are some of the most beautiful chapters that we'll find in all of the scriptures on the second coming and the resurrection of Christ. And although he was speaking to the first century believer, those words still bring great hope to our hearts today, don't they? Paul says at the last trumpet, and in the very end, the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Praise God for such a wonderful, blessed hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Now Paul, as we come to the second letter that he wrote, we find that now Paul is addressing a different issue. It seems as though after he wrote the first letter that people were embracing the truth of the second coming, but they had gone to another extreme. They believed that Christ had now come. He was in their mess, midst in a spiritual way, that Christ's coming was already happening in a spiritual way in Paul's day. So Paul, when he got word of what was taking place, he responded and he said, Christ can't come first until a significant event occurs. And so we pick up here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to follow along with me. Notice what Paul writes here. He says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, what day is that? That's the day of the Lord. That's the second coming of Christ. That day will not come unless, so this has to happen first, unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now, most scholars, as they read these passages of Paul, they see that they are the same as the beast power of Revelation 13. So the man of sin is equivalent to the beast power of Revelation 13, that both of the passages identify the rise and the work of the Antichrist power. Now, brothers and sisters, what's significant here in 2 Thessalonians 2 is the sequence by which the final events occur. As you know, there's a popular theory out there now in the Christian church called the secret rapture. And most are probably familiar with what this teaching is. The secret rapture scenario says that 
there will be a secret disappearance of God's people. There will be a pilot, and he's flying a plane, and, and suddenly, the, and he's a Christian, and, and there's the rapture, and the pilot secretly disappears, and the plane crashes to the ground. Or there's a taxi driver, and he's a Christian, and he's driving this taxi with a group of people, and suddenly at the rapture, he disappears, and the, and the taxi crashes into the wall, and those in the vehicle die. Those who are left behind after the rapture are given a second chance, they say, called the seven-year tribulation. And in the middle of those seven years, the Antichrist arises and brings great havoc upon the earth. The question is, is that concept a biblical one? Does it line up with what Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Well, the answer is no. As we just read in verses 1 through 5, Paul lays out a sequence where the secret rapture people teach that the second coming of Jesus will happen first and then the, secret, uh, the, the Antichrist will rise. Paul says just the opposite happens. He says that the man of sin or this Antichrist power rises first. He exalts himself. He sits in the temple of God. He shows himself as God on earth. There's a falling away that takes place. And after all that happens, Paul says, then and only then will the day of the Lord occur. Do you see the difference between the two main ideas? Friends, it's amazing what is being taught today in the churches. We really have to be careful what we read and what we watch anymore. Because most popular preachers on TV and on the radio are teaching end time scenarios that are not lining up with the Word of God. We need to be studying these things for ourselves. As Paul says, we are to rightly divide the Word of Truth. Now, look how serious things become just before the coming of Jesus. So there's this falling away, there's this Antichrist power. But look how serious things become, starting in verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. In other words, Paul is saying the spirit of lawlessness is already taking place in the first century, in the days of Paul. In the church. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. So he says there will come a time when the restrainer who's been restraining will now be removed and the Antichrist power will be able to do the final works of deception upon the earth. Verse 8 it continues, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive what? The love of the what? Of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. When you read these passages, it is pretty sobering stuff, isn't it? Paul writes in the very end, Satan will work through this antichrist power to work signs and wonders to deceive the planet. Those who will be ready for the coming of Jesus are those who have received the love of the truth. Those who are not ready are those who have rejected God's end-time truths for the planet. They had chosen the path of sin and pleasure rather than following the commands of God as is revealed in his word. And as a result, God honors that choice. He, he withdraws his spirit upon the earth, and people are deluded by Satan's final deceptions. Friends, that's pretty serious stuff, wouldn't you say? Now, most people do not realize, I believe, the seriousness of the times in which we live. I don't know if Adventists really realize the seriousness of the times in which we live as well. 
Because many are continuing on as though business as usual. It seems that many upon the planet see the time will continue on as it always has, that, there's, that we can continue to pursue a path of sin and pleasure and entertainment, and, and there's no sense of a day of accountability. But Paul here warns otherwise. He says very shortly, things on earth will change. And what's important is for us to be ready when those events happen. Now, I have to be honest, as I read these passages, it makes us all wonder. If this is all coming upon the earth, how then can we be saved? Is there any hope for us, or will we too be swept away by what these final events describe? Is there any hope? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us an answer in the next few verses, and this is where I'd like to spend the rest of our time this morning as we conclude our series on Thessalonians. And notice what Paul writes, and we're going to read a section of verses 13 through 17. Here's how Paul says we're going to be saved and be ready for Christ's coming, because all of this is coming, he says. But notice as we start in verse 13. He says, but we are bound. Now, the word but there is a transitional word. Paul is saying after all this is to take place, he now moves our thoughts towards the wonderful provision that God has provided so that we can be saved in the end. He says, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you. Now, who's the you? It's not just applying to the first century believer, right? The you is you and me. Those are living in the final days. He is talking to us. God chose us not for deception, but he chose us as he goes on. He chose you and me for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and our Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So here in these passages, God, uh, Paul reveals to us two key elements and how to be saved in the end. And friends, both of these are vitally important for us to know and understand so that we will be ready, so we will be saved. The first key element that he mentions here is that in order to be saved, we need to experience, he says, the sanctified life. Do you realize that Paul, over and over in his writings, he talks about the concept of sanctification? In fact, look at a few verses. We're going to do a quick tour through First and Second Thessalonians. Go to the first passage. We have it on the screen here, these texts. Just do a quick reading. First Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 11 is our first passage. And just notice how many times he refers to this idea of sanctification. Now, we read this in our scripture passage this morning. Look just at verse 13. He says, So that he may establish your hearts blameless how? In what? In holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. Now go to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. We'll come back to this in just a little bit. He says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and in honor. Then move your eyes down to verse 7. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in what? In holiness. Now, look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, just the next chapter. Notice how often Paul talks about sanctification. Verse 23, now may, God, may, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Holiness, the word for holiness, is the same thing as sanctified. 
See, what Paul is writing is the burden that he has and, and the desire that God has is that he's preparing a people to be ready for his coming. And they are continuing to grow in God's grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, one other passage, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 11. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 11. Paul writes, it says, Therefore we also pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Friends, when you read these passages and others, it is clear that Paul believes that the highest ethical and spiritual standards can be met in the life of the believer. That a believer of Jesus Christ can experience a life of holiness and sanctification. But how can that happen? How that can that be realized? Is it something that we can do on our own? Is it something that we're to work for and strive towards? Who's the active agent in the sanctification process? Well, look at the next chapter, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. Going back to what we just read earlier, Paul makes it very clear how this, who is the agent, how this will happen. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification. How? By what? By the Spirit. Friends, it is the work of the Holy Spirit by which we experience character growth. Nowhere ever in Scripture does it mention human beings making themselves holy. It's an impossibility. It's something that you and I can never do, because why? We are born into this world of fallen natures. Our hearts are wicked. Jeremiah writes, who can change them? The changed life comes about when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and brings about the wonderful transformation into God's character. I think of the story of Nicodemus. I love the stories that you find in the Gospels, particularly in the Gospel of John. That's my favorite Gospel of them all. And Nicodemus, you know, he was a good Seventh-day Adventist, right? He was keeping the Sabbath, he was paying tithe, he was going to church, he was an elder, he was respected by all the people. If anyone, from an outward appearance, if anyone's going to make it into the kingdom of God, it would have been Nicodemus. But there was still something missing. And so he came to Jesus one night, and he came alone so no one could see him. And right away, Jesus knew his condition, and he cut to the chase, and he said, Nicodemus, except you be born again, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus says, what do you mean, Jesus? How could I go through my mother's wound a second time? It's, it's not possible. And Jesus said it very clearly. He said, Nicodemus, except you're born of the water and of what? The Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Jesus made it very clear. The work of the Holy Spirit plays a vital role and the work of salvation. By faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit brings about the new birth. He changes our fleshly hearts and turns them into spiritual ones. Friends, that is a miracle of God, isn't it? Now look at this uh, quotation, The Desire of Ages. She writes, I came across these two quotes, which kind of was an impetus for the sermon. It says, it is through the Spirit that Christ dwells in us. And the Spirit of God received into the heart by faith is the beginning of what? Of life eternal. And then you have this quote from the Great Controversy, page 469. The followers of Christ are to become like him by the grace of God to form characters in harmony with the principles of his holy law. This is Bible sanctification. This work can be accomplished only through faith in Christ by the power of the indwelling Spirit of God. In these last days, God desires to bring about continual growth of character. This comes about by an acceptance of God's power day by day. As long as life lasts, there will be continual growth. 
There will never be a stopping place where we'll say, hey, I got it all together. I finally have attained. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. So what is then the tangible evidence of the sanctified life? Go with me. We'll come back in a moment to 2 Thessalonians. Go to Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. I know you're familiar with this passage But Paul clarifies for us the work of the Holy Spirit in one's life. Notice what it says, Galatians 5. Now, when you look at verse 19, he talks about the works of the flesh. And when we read that list, we say, yeah, that that represents my true nature. I mean, I'm in the carnal nature. And these things tend to manifest themselves from time to time in our lives. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I've also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The works of the flesh. You and I both know that these tend to manifest themselves in our lives. But verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, so the evidence of the Spirit working in the life, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying envying one another. There are many who claim that they have given their hearts to Jesus, but their lives have never changed through the years. They continue to practice the same sins over and over again without feeling any kind of remorse. If that happens, one then needs to begin to ask the question, has true conversion actually taken place in the life? Because the genuine evidence of the new birth is having this intense desire that you want to live your life in harmony with God's will. Anything of another profession amounts to nothing because Christ needs to be revealed in the life. Now, I shared before, I am so thankful for how God had worked in my life during my college years. And I'm thankful how God uses people that he brings into your life, that plants a seed here and plants a seed there. And there came a time when I recognized my need of Jesus Christ in my life, and I I surrendered my life to him. And friends, it was the best decision I ever made. Now, looking back, I can see there's a whole lot of things. When you look at that list of the workings of the flesh, that represented my life. And I'm thankful when Jesus came into my life. Now, it doesn't happen all together, but step by step, he's taking away one thing and and bringing something new in my life at a different time. Life with Jesus has never been the same since, and I would never want to go back. But I have to ask, if I was still the same person today as I was 20 years ago, there would be a problem, wouldn't there? Because, friends, when the Holy Spirit grabs hold of your life, He infuses power into your life that you did not have before. And we become a new creature in Jesus Christ. I find that good news, don't you? Because that means that the the habits that we seem to have been chained to for so long, whether it's an addiction, whether it's a negative attitude, whether it's some thought or, or habit that seems to just control us, The good news of the gospel is that Jesus can change us. We can be set free. And we can walk in the newness of life and we become a new person. We can be a more loving husband. We can be a more understanding mother. We can be a better friend. Now, when I was reading and studying for uh, this series in Thessalonians, there's one area of sanctification that Paul specifically addresses And so I wanted to go over there, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and notice these verses, and we mentioned them earlier, 1 Thessalonians 4, so we're going back to the first letter that he wrote. Look at verses 3 through 7, if you would. It says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, 
But now he gets very specific. He says that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel and sanctification and honor. Not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. So friends, in Paul's day, the city of Thessalonica was a very immoral place. Sexual sin was rampant all across the the city and empire, all across the Roman Empire, which, by the way, is very similar to our day. Just turn on the TV set, and you will see how sex-driven, pleasure-seeking society that we are today. I mean, there should be a lot of shows that we should immediately turn off because they're flaunting immorality right before our eyes. And what's troubling is as Christians, we're sitting there in front of the screen, absorbing this all in, and it's tearing us down spiritually. Notice here, Paul warns us, five of the 18 verses in this chapter, he's talking about moral impurity. And Paul says this in in verse 3, he says, this is your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. The word for immorality in the Greek is pornea. It refers to sexual immorality, whether you're married or unmarried. It doesn't matter. It deals with homosexuality. It deals with adultery, pornography, sex outside of marriage. In these final days, those who are being sanctified and being saved for the kingdom of God will not be controlled by the passions of lust, but instead they'll be controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit in his or her life. And they recognize that their bodies are the temple of God and how they treat their bodies and who they give their bodies to that they are going to do all for the glory of God because he dwells in us. Friends, sexual sin is a real issue today. Do you know that statistics show that over 40 to 50 percent, I don't have the exact number, but 40 to 50 percent of Christian men struggle with pornography? That's a high number. You know, because what the reason is, right? The internet. You can access pornography like no other generation, just like that. And then all of a sudden, flashing on the screen are these temptations all the time. And it's not much different, by the way, when it comes to Christian women. Do you know that sexual sin is one of those things that Satan will use to try and bring down God's people in the end? And by the way, sexual sin, you know, we're in an academy setting, and so we often think, well, sexual sin is just for the young. It's just what teenagers deal with, just what young adults deal with. I have found through the years that sexual sin is a struggle across the board, young and old alike, and all in between. Just because we're in our latter years doesn't mean that we're immune from sexual temptation. In fact, this is what Ellen White wrote. This is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 457 and 458. As we approach the close of time, As the people of God stand upon the borders of the heavenly Canaan, Satan will, as of old, what will he do? Redouble his efforts to prevent them from entering the goodly land. Do I have that correct on the screen? Okay, there we have it. I'm sorry. He will redouble his efforts to prevent them from entering the goodly land. He lays his snares for every soul. He employs the same agents now as he employed 3,000 years ago by worldly friendships, you know, being with people who not have the Christian standard and we're in a relationship with them and they're tempting us to compromise our moral purity. He puts people in our lives to bring our fall by worldly friendships, by the charms of beauty, by pleasure-seeking, mirth, feasting, or the wine cup. He tempts to the violation of the seventh commandment. Friends, if this is a struggle, my prayer is, my appeal is to reach out for help. Sexual sin is not something that we are to play around with. Do whatever it takes to get this out of our lives. Yes, God will forgive, but the consequences of those sins are great. And many times 
We are scarred in our families or those close to us and your pain and hurt because of our actions. Paul is appealing. He's getting very practical. He says, these things are coming. Are we ready? And he says, the way to be ready is one, the way to be saved in the end is to experience the sanctified life allowing the Holy Spirit to bring the change in our lives, to have the character that God is desiring so that we're ready when he comes in the clouds. Now, the other way that he says, the other key element here is he says the way to be saved in the end is to stand on the truth of God's word. So go back with me, 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 2, if you would, as we wrap up here, 13 through 15, going back. He says, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you. This is verse 13. Brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you. He chose us for salvation through salva- sanctification by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And notice the next part. And belief in what? In the truth. To which he called you by our gospel for the attaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught whether by word or by epistle, our epistle. When we lived in St. Louis, one of the things I enjoyed doing was riding the subway train into downtown. They have a great subway system there. And if you've ever ridden on a train, you know how important it is to hold on the rail because once they start taking off or when they start slowing down, you better hold on or you're going to lose your footing and you can easily stumble to the ground. And friends, our world is moving like a subway train. Everything seems to be changing around us. I mean, it's incredible what we are seeing happening in these last couple of years. And what is important in these changing times is to grab hold of something that is solid and secure. Otherwise, if we don't, we'll be heading for disaster like the rest of the world. Paul says the way to stay firm is to hold on to the traditions that we were taught. In other words, hold on to the Word of God. It is the only means that will keep us from falling. Now I was struck, you know, Paul says that we are saved here in verse 13. We're saved by belief in the truth. That idea of truth is so foreign today because we live in a postmodern era, which says there is no truth. You believe what you want to believe, I'll believe what I want to believe, everybody is right. Truth is what you feel in your hearts. And this idea or this way of thinking is what Paul describes earlier in the chapter. So that when the end comes and the man of sin is revealed and the Antichrist power works, many are going to be deceived because they did not receive the love of the truth. Why? Because they chose a path of pleasure and sin rather than following the word of God. And so they're not ready in the end, and they'll be lost because of the deceptions. Friends, our only safeguard is to stand on the truths of Scripture. But in order to believe the truth, one must know and study the truth, which is why it's important for us to read and study the Word of God for ourselves every day. So how is it going? How are we spending our time with the Lord? There are different ways to have the scriptures stay fresh in our minds. I'm thankful for the emphasis. You know, David, you've been emphasizing the FAST program. One of the ways is scripture memorization. Memorizing scripture, having that in our minds to be fresh and be able to recite them when we need them. Another way is to be involved in a small study group where you can be challenged be part of a Sabbath school class, or you could be part of a midweek prayer meeting where we're having discussion around God's Word. Some are doing yearly Bible readings. Friends, we need to stay fresh in God's Word. To believe the truth means that we're studying the truth and we're spending time in God's Word every day. And by the way, studying the truth doesn't mean we just have head knowledge. Because there's a lot of people who have head knowledge of truth But that head knowledge has not been applied to their lives. I've met a lot of people through the years who know the truth, but they're some of the most critical, argumentative, and unkind people that you'll ever meet. Is that really believing the truth? Or is that fulfilling our own desires and our own ways of doing things? 
When we believe the truth and study the truth, we're submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit leading and bringing out the fruits of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, being patient and kind. Truth should cause us to be the most loving, the most kind, and the most Christ-like people on earth. So that when people look to us, they say, wow, that's Jesus. That's who I want to be like. Two ways of being saved, he said, two keys, I should say, two keys for being saved, experiencing the sanctified life and standing firm on the word of God. Now, Paul, after making this appeal, notice he concludes by sharing how much God loves them. And so let's look at verses 19, 16 and 17. Now may the, our Lord Christ Jesus himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Now, when I read that, especially verse 16, I said, wow, that's a direct Im uh, correlation to John 3.16. The imagery, the language is the same. God loved. God gave. And how did he do that? How did he do that? He gave up his only son to die on the cross to save us from our sins. And by believing in him, we can have everlasting life. And so there is no greater love that Paul can mention than that of the cross. God's love shown at Calvary becomes the basis for all comfort and hope, which was immensely important for the Thessalonians because of all that they've been through. As we've been highlighting all summer, they've, say, they've suffered persecution, affliction. They were despised by family and friends for their faith. And many became disheartened. And Paul is saying here in these verses, don't become discouraged. Know God's good hope and grace. Good hope is in contrast to the false hope aroused by the false teachers of the day. And what is this good hope that he's talking about? Well, Paul refers to hope in a different passage. In Titus 2.13, he says, Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The good hope is the blessed hope of Christ's soon return. Friends, the reason why we can face hardship, the reason we can keep going on, the reason we can face an uncertain future is God loves us so much. He died for us. He went to heaven, and he has promised that one day he will come back to take us home. Hallelujah. Friend of mine, I don't know what you're going through this morning, and I'm so thankful for this special music. Many today are facing hardship and difficulty. And as times get harder and harder, which they are and which they will, my appeal is to all of us is to hang on. Don't let go. Remain steadfast. Hold on to the truths of God's word. Because one day soon, Jesus is going to come. One day, the trumpet will sound. One day the dead in Christ will rise. One day we who are alive will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Friends, until that day, let us be faithful, will you say? I wanted to close with this story. I heard this a few years ago, and it was, some of you may have heard this. It's quite moving to me. It was a lady, her name was Mrs. Smith, and she had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. So once she knew that she had about three months to live, she wanted to get her affairs in order. So she called the local pastor and said, Pastor, can you come over, and can we meet, and can we go over the order of service, and can we talk about my funeral? And by the way, I think it's a wise thing to do, to plan ahead of time. Some are fearful, they don't like to talk about death, they don't like to talk about the day of our... Um, when we have our, uh, what do you call it, the eulogy, the, our funeral service. Uh, Angela talks to me at times. She said, let's do this and do this. And she's uh, been encouraging 
for us to talk about those things. It's a good thing to do, isn't it? So this lady was talking with the pastor. She said, well, I'd like to be able to have a, a casket and it'd be open. And I'd like for them to put me in, a, in one of my favorite dresses. I'd like to be able to have my Bible because the Bible means so much to me. But there's also, I have one other request, pastor. I'd like to be able to have in my right hand, I'd like to be holding a fork. Pastor said, what do you mean, a fork? She said, well, let me tell you the reason. I love going to church socials, and I love going to potlucks, and I enjoy all the good food, but one of my favorite moments is after I eat the main meal that someone will kneel over and they will whisper in my ear, would you like to have some dessert? You can leave your fork because dessert is coming. And she said, oh, I love the dessert. I love those pies. And it seems like it's the highlight of the meal. And, and so that's the best moment of the potlucks. She said, Pastor, please, just bury me. Have me hold in my hand in the casket that fork. And don't, when people go by, don't tell them what it is. Tell them later in the message what it represents. And so sure enough, she, three months later, tragically, she died of terminal cancer. And so they made the arrangements for the service, and there uh, Mrs. Smith was laying in the casket, and she had her dress on and had the Bible in one hand, and in the other hand was the fork. And people came for the visitation the night before, and they kept asking, why is she have this fork in her hand? A countless number of people were questioning, and the pastor was standing by the side, and he was just smiling uh, on his face, and he said, I know, I'm going to be addressing that tomorrow. And so the next morning came, and he stood there, and he was giving his message, and the pastor told them of the conversation that he had with Mrs. Smith shortly before the, he had, she had died. He told them about the fork and what it symbolized to her, that she was looking forward to something better that was coming. And he told the group, he said, I could not stop thinking about that. Ever since Mrs. Smith mentioned to me, to me, every time I eat a meal with my family, I keep thinking about that fork and how something better is coming, which was the coming of Jesus. And friends, is it not true? Something better is on the way. Paul says, let us be steadfast. Let's hang on. Let's let God do his good work in us because something better is coming. Jesus coming is soon. Let us be ready. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good work that you do in each of us. Lord, we are living in very serious times. And what we're reading here and Paul's writings is about to unfold on this planet. We have never yet seen anything like what you have described in your word. These are serious times, Lord. Help us as Adventists to realize the times in which we live. And Lord, as we are entering to these final days, we want you to do the good work in us. We want the Holy Spirit to bring about that change in our lives. We want to experience the sanctified life. We want victory in our life. And Lord, we are so weak. We can never do it on our own. But today we reach out to you. We want to grab hold of your power and your grace in our lives. And all things are possible through you. And so Lord, as times change all around us. Help us to be steadfast in your word. Lord, help us to not be swayed by the culture, but help us to stand firm in the teachings and principles of your word. Lord, something better is coming. Help us to remain steadfast. Help us to hold on. And if there anybody is here this morning that's discouraged or they're ready to give up, I pray that you renew their hearts with the good hope, the blessed hope of Jesus' soon return. Thank you for hearing our prayer this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.